We are talking today with Aaron Glantz. He is a reporter with Pacifica Radio and author of the book, How America Lost Iraq. Aaron, thanks for spending time with us today. It's good to be with you. Start out and tell me what was your motivation in writing your book, How America Lost Iraq? Well, I came back from uh, Iraq in May of 2004. I've made three trips to Iraq. I was there right after the fall of Saddam Hussein uh, for about a month. Uh, I came back in the spring of 2004, and then I was just there recently for the elections. And um, I was there for three months in 2004 during a, a February, uh, March, April, and part of May. And um, that was the worst time. You know, that is when things got really bad. I was there at the beginning of the uh, occupation as well. Uh, I interviewed many people who supported the American presence as kind of like anything to get rid of Saddam Hussein. You know, I traveled to this village called Al-Mufraqiyah, which is near Kut in southern Iraq. Uh, I interviewed people who had had relatives killed in the U.S. bombing campaign, uh, but they had also had relatives killed by Saddam's regime, and they had been imprisoned by Saddam and lost their jobs because of Saddam, and they felt... Uh, if this is going to be the last killing we have to deal with, then okay, you know it's a price that we're prepared to pay. Um, but that was changing over time, and the U.S. military failed to uh, restore the electricity, uh, failed to restore clean drinking water. Uh, I mean, you just imagine, uh, last time I was in Iraq in February, uh, there was uh, n not a dependable working street light that I could find. I mean, you just imagine Seattle with not a dependable working street light and the kind of traffic jams that that would cause and the kind of violence that people's frustration over those traffic jams would cause. And, and then projected on a city like Baghdad as six million people, um, you know, that is kind of more laid out like LA, you know, where road rage is more the rave anyway. And, uh, and that's just the traffic issue. Um, so, so this was building. Then in, in March, at, at the end of March, April, and early May 2004, the United States did a series of incredibly terrible things all at the same time that really caused people to move from this position of uncomfortability, passive anger, towards active support of military actions against U.S. forces in Iraq. Uh, those were the attack on Muqtada Sutter, the Abu Ghraib prison scandal, and uh, the massive assault on Fallujah, which all happened at the same time. And uh, when I got back to America in May of 2004 and I was talking to people, I was trying to explain what happened in Fallujah, for example, where in the response to the killing of four American mercenaries with Blackwater security out of North Carolina, uh, as a response to their killings, uh, the U.S. military sealed off uh, the city and bombed Fallujah so badly that the municipal football stadium had to be turned into a graveyard and whole streets, and I saw this with my own eyes, were completely destroyed and trying to communicate this with people. And people had no basis for understanding it. They had not seen the pictures on the television here uh, like people in Iraq had. I mean, Al Jazeera was broadcasting from the hospital and from this football stadium, you know, turned graveyard uh, during April of 2004. And people were seeing it in their homes all around Iraq, even if they uh, weren't experiencing it personally. But here in this country, nobody saw it. So I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, uh, John Stauber, who's written the excellent book Weapons of Mass Deception, uh, about the, the lies around the weapons of mass destruction issue. And uh, I was explaining all this stuff that I'm just telling you now. Uh, and then at the end, and I said, and that's how America lost Iraq. And he said, well, you have to write that as a book. And let me put in touch with you in touch with my publisher, because this kind of in-depth, lengthy explanation that you can't do uh, as a radio reporter, you really need 300 pages for it. Uh, and... Uh, you know, I'm really hopeful that when people read the book, they can kind of better understand all the dynamics at play. So tell us, how is it that you ended up being in Iraq in the first place on your first trip over? Well, I mean, I, I'm a community radio journalist. I came up through KPFA, which is the Pacifica station in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm from San Francisco. I got involved in radio uh, to cover my own community. I was uh, worried about some of the key issues in San Francisco, which are very similar to the issues here, issues of gentrification, uh, issues of people being pushed out of the city. I mean, I grew up in San Francisco. I can't afford to buy a house in San Francisco. I grew up there, you know, but, you know, like other people, 
you know, uh, low-wage workers, people working in the hotels and stuff are, you know, much worse situation than me. You know, reporting around those issues, around issues of, uh, you know, the need for better public transportation, stuff like that. I ended up being the state capital reporter for KPFA. And, uh, you know, after a while, I ended up working on the national news uh, as a producer. And I was talking to people working around the world uh, as journalists. And I realized that hey, you know, I can do this kind of work. I can help shed light on communities around the country, around the world, uh, you know, and talk about issues important to them the same way that uh, issues of uh, affordable housing and good public transportation are personally, you know, were extremely important to me. And so I went to Jordan and Turkey uh, before the Iraq war with two reasons, uh, one of which was to explain kind of the geopolitical dynamics at play. You know, for example, I did a, a story about the free trade zone in Jordan where imported workers from Bangladesh were making uh, clothes for Walmart for export in the United States with Israeli inputs in Jordan, right? And, and other stories like this that kind of helped to, you know, give a little bit of depth uh, to the bombing story. Um, and I also train journalists in, uh, in Jordan and, and Turkey to report for Free Speech Radio News and Pacifica Radio because I think the community radio and people reporting on their own communities it's really important. I didn't go to Iraq uh, because it was impossible to do community-centered journalism in Iraq at that time. Saddam Hussein assigned everyone a minder. Uh, you got to talk to the people that your minders wanted you to talk to. Uh, even if you did somehow manage to talk to somebody different, uh, they had things that they needed to say because if anyone in the government found out that they said the wrong thing, then they could end up in prison. Um, and so uh, that's one of the reasons why, you know, a lot of people, I think, on the left were surprised when uh, the uh, Iraqi resistance to the initial invasion wasn't that fierce because we kept hearing that, you know, Iraqis would fight to the last man and all this stuff. Uh, and that was a very unified message. Well, that was because Saddam was a dictator and people were only allowed to say that. Uh, you know, and it was only through experience that we are finding out, you know, what people really think and feel over there. Um, but then, after the fall of Saddam's regime, uh, you know, it was completely unclear what was going on, you know, after the U.S. military crane tore down uh, Saddam's statue on April 9th. But it was very clear that, you know, for a community radio journalist like myself, I would be able to talk to communities in Iraq and bring their voices, uh, you know, to listeners in the United States. And so on April, I mean, on May 1st, uh, 2003, the day that George Bush landed on the USS Abraham Lincoln off the coast of San Diego and declared mission accomplished, on that day I was in Fallujah. And I had just taken a taxi from where I was staying in Baghdad. We just hailed it from the street, went out to Fallujah. It cost $10, you know, to drive for about 40 minutes in this taxi. The guy dropped us off in the center of town, and we walked around uh, the marketplace to try to figure out uh, what was going on in Fallujah because uh, earlier in that week, uh, the U.S. military had opened fire on a demonstration there, uh, killing 12 people. Uh, the people were protesting the takeover of their school by the military, which had turned into a military base. Um, and we wanted to see if this was going to blow up into a kind of occupation and resistance scenario. Uh, but actually what ended up happening was the pro-Bathist preacher that had the biggest mosque in Fallujah instead told his congregation not to protest. Uh, he told them Islam was a religion of peace, and he told them that even though the Americans were terrible people, that uh, it was uh, advisable to work with them and that he was in negotiations with the Americans at that time uh, in May of 2003. I mean, the point of that story is that uh, early in the occupation, it was it was very easy. I mean, really shockingly easy as an unembedded journalist to get different perspectives and to really go to the ground and, and find out what people uh, were saying and feeling. And people were saying and feeling a lot of different things, you know, at that time. And yet, a lot of that wasn't getting back to Americans here in the U.S. Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, early on, I mean, my own feeling. Uh, is that I wasn't here at that time. You know, I had been gone for most of 2002 and early 2003, and I started to actually get in arguments with my editors at Pacifica because I wanted to cover Saddam Hussein's mass graves because everyone was really concerned about Saddam's brutality um, in Iraq. And they were finally understanding, you know, who was killed, who was still alive. The cover of the book, uh, How America Lost Iraq, is a woman walking away from one of Saddam's mass graves in uh, Babylon where tens of thousands 
thousands of people who rose up in 1991 after George Bush Sr. told them to uh, and, and promised support. And when he withdrew his support, Saddam used his air power to crush this rebellion and rounded up all the supporters and threw them in a ditch outside of Hilla. Um, I mean, this was important to folks. They were finally being able to take account of those who had been killed. Uh, and when I would talk to my editors and say I wanted to cover this story, they would say, well, we are getting this constantly in kind of a propaganda mode. Um, you know, Saddam was bad, therefore the war was good. Look at these mass graves. And I was arguing with them and saying, no, this is the important issue of the day. We need to focus on it. And I think one of the things that I'm really trying to do in my journalism, what I try to do in the book, what I try to do in my reporting, is to really take the focus uh, off of what happens to be the debate here you know, in this country and try to really just give it straight, you know, what is happening, uh, what are people saying and try to get it off of the America focus of, of news coverage in this country. Because, um, I mean, I think that one of the reasons that almost all journalists are embedded uh, is not some kind of conspiracy. I think it's because the news organizations in this country want to cover the American aspect of the war, and the American aspect of the war is the American troops. And I think covering the American troops is important, and I'm glad there are embedded journalists. But um, why are there so few unembedded journalists, you know, telling the stories of Iraqi people? There are 25 million Iraqi people and 135,000 U.S. servicemen over there. Uh, I mean, there needs to be some uh, perspective. Uh, and so I think, you know, kind of extrapolating out further, um, we see amongst the scandals in May of 2004 that were all breaking out simultaneously that I mentioned, the Abu Ghraib prison scandal, the attack on Muqtada Sutter, and the attack on Fallujah, the one that got the most play, I understand, in this country was the Abu Ghraib prison scandal. Why? because it was 60 Minutes that broke the story on CBS News because there were photos of American soldiers doing bad things. Uh, it was still an American-centered story, even though it was about Iraq. Uh, the Iraqi side of that story uh, that I was experiencing on a daily basis uh, was a little bit different. I mean, people were outraged. They were genuinely outraged about those pictures. But what was more outrageous was the fact that the Americans are constantly on patrol through their neighborhoods, arresting people and taking them to Abu Ghraib. And one of the things that I write about in the book is this trip that I took to Abu Sifa, which is a town north of Iraq by about an hour near Balad in the heart of the Sunni Triangle. There was apparently a, a Ba'athist you know, one of these former regime elements that they talk about uh, who was organizing attacks on the nearby U.S. military base. So the Americans came in the middle of the night. Uh, they found the biggest house in town. Um, they ordered everyone out of the house. They shot it up with a machine gun. Then they fired two shots from the barrel of their tank, destroying the house. It was not the house of the man they were looking for. They didn't know who he was. So they rounded up 83 men in the village. All the men who happened to be there at that particular time were arrested and taken to Abu Ghraib. And when I went to this village, which was nine months after the raid, only one of them, only one of these 83 people had been released. And he was a 15-year-old boy. And he talked about uh, having a dog put in a cell in Abu Ghraib where he was kept 24 hours a day in solitary confinement. Um, where uh, the American soldiers would uh, throw pebbles at him to keep him from sleeping. And uh, he had done nothing wrong. He was a 15-year-old boy. And there is absolutely nothing exceptional about this story. And to really understand how unexceptional it is, all you have to do is look at the arrest last week of Mohsen Abdel Hamid, who's a very prominent Iraqi politician, who has been a peacemaker between the resistance and the Americans. He is really the only important Sunni politician who's calling for cooperation and peace and, um, and negotiating peacefully an end to the occupation over some reasonable period of time instead of war. This guy, who's like the best friend that America has in Iraq in terms of the ability for him to bring credibility, you know, to making the situation more peaceful, was arrested. His house was trashed, he was hooded, his face was stepped on, and he was taken and interrogated at a U.S. military base before he was released. Um, the fact that that happens to someone like him indicates how capricious they are in arresting people. And, uh, and that was the Abu Ghraib prison story in Iraq. Um, and it was very difficult, actually, to get that, get that out because people here were so focused on the photos of the Americans. When you say it was difficult to get that out, was that difficult just in addition to our corporate media coverage? Did you find that difficult with Pacifica, your outlet? 
Well, in the beginning, when I wanted to do stories about Saddam's brutality, because I thought those were key, that was difficult with Pacifica, because they were fighting a propaganda war, you know, against the Bush administration's propaganda war. Later on, when the Abu Ghraib prison scandal came, my own interest in what I thought was the most important thing coincided almost exactly with what Pacifica wanted to talk about. You know, the truth and their ideology, you know, had come into line over time. Uh, but still, it was, I think, difficult, mostly in the way that American people listen to the radio and, and consume news. Um, you know, I filed stories about Fallujah. I interviewed a 12-year-old boy whose 11-year-old best friend was gunned down in front of his school. I uh, talked about how the U.S. military was shooting at ambulances in Fallujah. I mean, I don't know to this day if they were shooting them on purpose or not, but I have photos of ambulances that are riddled with bullet holes. Um, I uh, talked to a man who had been shot right below the collarbone. Uh, while he went out to get food aid from a neighborhood mosque, and he was very lucky because American military snipers aim for the neck. But the problem is they shoot at everything that moves. Uh, I, when I went to Fallujah, I saw a, a woman. Uh, she had been trying to flee the city in her car, and, um, and while, uh, she was, uh, while she was trying to flee the city in her car, her car was bombed by the U.S. military because the military was bombing everything that moved. One of her neighbors courageously uh, went and pulled her corpse out of the car and buried it in his front yard uh, because it was too unsafe to go to the football stadium turned graveyard because Americans were shooting at everything. When I went there after the fighting had stopped, uh, I saw a medical team pouring formaldehyde while they exhumed her body and taking her off you know, to the football stadium. And I will always remember the face of this young 12 or 13-year-old boy who was part of that medical team and thinking, what is it like? to be a 12 or 13 year old boy who has to ferry the carcasses of dead women, you know, around your city. Um, what is that like? Um, you know, what is it like to live in Iraq now and be afraid to go to work? Uh, what is it like to be a parent and be afraid to send your child to school? What is it like to live in 125 degree heat in the summer and not have electricity to run a fan? Um, these are not things that most Americans think about. And even when you're broadcasting stories about them, uh, it's very difficult to get people's focus, I think, off of the American aspects of the problems that are going on. You know, people, when I go around speaking, uh, people are more likely to ask me about Halliburton and the corruption there. Uh, or Bechtel and their corruption. Or the lies about weapons of mass destruction. Uh, than they are to ask me about what it's like in Iraq, uh, which is what I'm coming to talk about, because there are other people who are an experts, you know, on uh, issues of, of corporate greed. I'm more of an expert on, like, the way all of this is affecting regular people. Um, people are really driven, to, to, to even critical people, to ask about these other issues. Um, and so I think it's also a mindset. It's not just about editors. Talk about back up to when you first went to Iraq. I assume that you had a mindset already that was shaped in a large part on our progressive media. Did you find it a dramatic change from what you saw versus what you had perceived was going on there? I mean, I, I had spent the six months before the invasion working in Jordan and Turkey and during the invasion as well. And um, I mean, these were places where everyone opposed the war. I mean, everyone, 95 percent of people in Jordan, 90 percent of people in Turkey opposed the war. There was a march at the Kurdish, I mean, at the Turkish parliament in Ankara that I covered. There were hundreds of thousands of people there, and they forced their parliament to refuse to allow the U.S. military to use Turkey as a launching pad for a northern front. That was a huge victory for democracy in Turkey, that 90 percent of the people got their parliament to do something that the people wanted. Uh, I mean, uh, and, and I had no reason to disagree with them. Uh, during the bombing campaign, I was in Turkey. I went to this village called Özverin, which is 200 miles from the Iraqi border and 800 miles from Baghdad. The U.S. military accidentally bombed a lentil field there with a Tomahawk cruise missile. Um, the U.S. military bombed three villages in Turkey. The U.S. military bombed Syria and Iran by mistake. Uh, when I was in uh, Ankara covering Colin Powell's visit, where he tried to patch things up with the government of Turkey, which had voted against the war, uh, a Turkish journalist asked him about the bombing of a maternity ward in Baghdad. And Colin Powell said, 
when you see the images on your television screens, know that we are being as targeted as possible. And I was like, yeah, right. But when I went to Iraq myself, and I even went to that exact hospital that the journalist was asking about, um, I found that the truth was more complicated. Uh, I found that the reason the hospital was shot at was because there was a Fedayeen fighter who had taken up right in front of the hospital and was shooting at the Americans, and that he was violating the Geneva Convention by using the hospital as a place to shoot at an army when neither side is supposed to be there, and that the tank had returned fire and destroyed the maternity ward. Um, I really wanted there to be a good guy and a bad guy, you know? I mean, uh, but what I found was that the situation was really complicated. I mean, a lot of people, uh, I, I interviewed this old communist with no teeth, you know, the Communist Party used to be really important and powerful in Iraq back in the 50s and 60s, it's since less powerful. And uh, he said, let me tell you something. We can deal with the devil, the devil meaning America, uh, but not Saddam Hussein. In other words, we are happy that somebody came and got rid of Saddam. And if America tries to be another Saddam or be an occupying power, then we will try to take care of America. And we're more optimistic about a violent overthrow of the American occupation than we are about a violent overthrow of Saddam. Um, it just shows you how multi-layered everything was. Um, and uh, uh, that was very difficult. I mean, beyond the arguments that I had with the editors, that was very difficult personally for me. And actually, it's the main reason that I left Iraq after about a month was that, uh, I mean, also, there was no, you have to remember, at that time in Iraq, there's no telephone at all. Now there's mobile phones on uh, exclusive contract to Motorola. Uh, but there's no phone at all. The Americans have bombed the phone grid because it was a regime target because the regime could talk on the phone. Um, there's no phone. The political parties that are there now and the different factions were just emerging from dictatorship, so they were difficult to find and contact. Um, and um, there's no internet. Now there's internet, so you can check the email news and stuff, you know. Uh, there's no satellite dish uh, uh, yet. Uh, now there's satellite dish ubiquitous, so you can watch Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, and also... Um, you know, CNN International, BBC World, Deutsche Welle, there's a lot of international news coming in. But at that time, right after the invasion, it was almost impossible to get outside information. And it was really difficult to think. Um, and so I almost felt like I had to leave to process uh, the information. But then when I got back to this country, I realized that was a big mistake because there was no way to get any information here at all. And it was better to be confused in Iraq than it was to be here and have no ability to figure anything out. And one of your frustrations uh, when you left, was it with Pacifica itself? You had written an open letter to uh, your colleagues back at Pacifica? Well, yeah. I mean, I had, had, a, had a, big, uh, a big issue, you know, uh, with the fact that they, there was a lot of pressure against covering Saddam's crimes. And I was like, this is the truth, you know. And now, you can say, as many of them did, that America supported Saddam uh, from when he came to power in 1978 until... Uh, you know, 1991 when he invaded Kuwait. I mean, that's true. Uh, but that doesn't negate the fact that he was an oppressive dictator still. And uh, I, this doesn't mean that the war was right, but it's an issue that affects the lives of the people. And what I found when I was talking to folks was that people did not really understand or agree with the pre-war anti-war movement. You know, in fact, I interviewed someone much later, uh, this former Ba'athist general. Uh, he was in Diyala, halfway between Baghdad and the Iranian border. He was trying to negotiate an end uh, to the insurgency there. And he told the U.S. military, uh, you know, if you stop your patrols in our neighborhoods and if you give us jobs in the reconstruction, then we will stop shooting at you. And the Americans declined that. Uh, and so the resistance there continues. But uh, anyway, I was talking to him, and um, and he was saying, you know, I don't understand the anti-war movement in the United States. Before the war, when we wanted to get rid of Saddam Hussein, there were thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets, and they were chanting things like, no blood for oil. But it's not like there was no blood for oil. Saddam was taking the blood of the Iraqi people for oil. Um, where were the signs that said no to war, no to Saddam? Where were the signs that said human rights for Iraq? 
Um, then he said, now America is bombing Fallujah and killing uh, hundreds of, they're killing hundreds and hundreds of people. And they are uh, rounding people up here in Diyala and taking them to Abu Ghraib where they're being tortured. Where are the massive demonstrations against that? Um, the anti-war movement has its priorities all wrong. And I know that this is like a, a I mean, I wouldn't represent it that way myself. You know, I can see how things are more complicated than his representation of it. But that's how he was viewing it, you know, as a general in the old Iraqi army who was dissatisfied with the regime and opposed the regime and now uh, was part of uh, at least tacitly. He was kind of like one step removed from the resistance. He was the connection between the resistance and other folks. Um, you know, uh, like, what does this mean? Like, we, we, it, ca it means that we, we need to rethink things a little bit. At the time that I wrote the letter, the letter was not really uh, received well because uh, I think it was still that hyper period right after the initial invasion. Uh, now that it seems like we've settled down, we're with this uh, situation, unfortunately, for a long time, and also we have George Bush mouthing off about Syria and Iran, I do actually think that there's been a real recognition in the progressive media that other solutions need to be put forward and we can't just be so reactive. And I actually see it in the way Pacifica is covering uh, the Iran and the Syrian issue in particular, um, putting forward you know, Syrian human rights activists, asking them what they think should happen. Uh, I think that this is a really good way to go. And I recognize that one of the challenges of Saddam's regime was that unlike, for example, Iran, where there is a domestic uh, pro-democracy, pro-human rights movement, I mean, the uh, Nobel laureate, uh, Shirin Nabadi, uh, human rights activist from Iran against war and against the Iranian regime. Uh, so these are people who we can listen to and support. With Iraq, the security state was much more total, and the only people who were allowed to talk were uh, Kurdish people, and certainly Kurdish ideas are important, but they had won their autonomy, but they don't represent all of Iraq. They represent the Kurdish opinion in Iraq. And then, like uh, these uh, CIA plants, like Ahmed Chalabi and Ayad Alawi, uh, and of course, uh, we know they don't represent the people. So. Uh, in that pre-war period, uh, there was very little that the progressive media could do uh, to shine the light on Iraqi society. My concern came that after the regime fell, they wanted to continue to cover it the same way. But now we had this opportunity to, to really talk to people and hear and listen. And I think that uh, journalism, at the end of the day, uh, you can talk about muckraking, but I think it's really all about listening. So after you'd come back and you realized you were better off being back in Iraq, you went back and in that time period had Pacifica shifted, had progressive media shifted over to be more in line with your reporting, what you felt was an accurate portrayal of what was happening there? Well, actually what happened was that the events changed and the events changed to come in line with what Pacifica was broadcasting. Um, before, they wanted me to report that people supported the resistance. I mean, they didn't say it in those ways, but they wanted me to report on attacks on U.S. soldiers that were already going on, and I was telling them on the phone, I don't think that most people support that. That's not what I'm hearing. Uh, and I think that a bigger issue is like the lack of electricity and running water. And uh, I went to the hospital, the hospital that had been accidentally bombed by the Americans. The whole hospital wasn't destroyed, Ali Armouk Hospital. Um, you know, most of it was still open, just the maternity ward had been closed. And... Um, and the big problem there was uh, that there were lots of people in that hospital suffering from gastroenteritis from the dirty drinking water, and that people were dying of this for two reasons. One is that there was no medicine because of the sanctions in the war, and the second reason was because uh, people were so scared to go out of their house because the situation was so dangerous. There was so much looting and killing by criminals on the street that a lot of people who were suffering didn't even go to the hospital. So I thought these were important stories, but they didn't fit into that paradigm. Well, what happened was is that these problems, like the lack of electricity, the lack of clean water, the lack of security, uh, capricious behavior by U.S. forces, the, the fact that these problems endured caused people to support violent resistance more and to want to end the occupation immediately. Uh, which they hadn't previously thought, you know, we need to give Bush more time to fix these things. Then they realized that Bush wasn't actually trying to fix them. And so then they went to support more the insurgency. And at that point, um, there was no more arguing with the editors because their, what you could say maybe their bias 
in the beginning turned out to be fact later on. All right. So you saw the critical point was in about May 2004. Is that correct? Yeah. And I, mean, in, 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 I think, yes, absolutely. And I mean, April is the key month and in May, I think, as well. Um, I mean, we mentioned the Abu Ghraib prison scandal already. Um, the fact that those photos came out did not help. It, it cemented, um, you know, people's full realization that the stories that their relatives who had been released from Abu Ghraib were telling them were true. And it made people really concerned because, you know, at that time, the Iraqi minister of human rights was saying there was 11,000 people in Abu Ghraib. Um, now the U.S. military says there are 11,000 people in Abu Ghraib. Uh, like last month, they said this. And um, at that time, the U.S. military was saying there were 3,000 people. So I think you can uh, fairly guesstimate upward on the current 11,000 estimate. Um, so there was that. Then you have the attack on Muqtada Sutter, uh, which was completely unprovoked by the U.S. military. What started this fight between Muqtada Sutter and the U.S. military was that his newspaper was closed and he was branded a terrorist and he was supposed to be arrested or killed by the U.S. military. Now, who is Muqtada Sutter? He's a fundamentalist. He's a Shiite fundamentalist. But we have uh, fundamentalists in this country. We don't declare them terrorists and try to kill them just because they happen to be religious fundamentalists. Um, Muqtada Sutter's uh, father, Grand Ayatollah Mohammed Sadiq al-Sadr, along with all of his brothers, were killed by Saddam's regime in 1999 because Grand Ayatollah Mohammed Sadiq al-Sadr uh, gave a sermon about the oppression of Pharaoh on his people, and uh, both Saddam and the Iraqi people could read between the lines on that uh, and knew that he was calling for a revolution, so Saddam took care of him. And there was a massive revolt after that by Shiites, which the U.S. did not support. His uncle, Mohammed Bakr al-Sadr, is also a Grand Ayatollah and an even more important figure. He's the religious inspiration, actually, behind the current Iraqi government, which was elected. Uh, if you go to the website of the Dawa party, uh, Hezbel Dawa, the Islamic preaching party, which has elected Ibrahim Jafri, the prime minister of Iraq, comes from this party, you'll see a photo in the corner of Grand Ayatollah Mohammed Bakr al-Sadr, the spiritual inspiration of this political party. In 1970, uh, in the 60s, he wrote these two books, Our Economy and Our Philosophy which are the cornerstones of Islamic political thought. And uh, when Ayatollah Khomeini overthrew the Shah of Iran in 79, uh, his ideas were very influential in drafting the new Iranian constitution. And he tried to replicate that in, um, in Iraq at that time, at the same time Saddam Hussein was coming, from, coming to power. So um, Jimmy Carter was the president at that time. And uh, he saw what was happening in Iran with the hostage crisis, and he decided that uh, it was better to sit back and watch Saddam Hussein kill Mohammed Bakr al-Sadr, his sister Bint al-Huda, and all of uh, his followers. And tens of thousands of people were rounded up and killed at that time, uh, first under Carter, then under Reagan, and Washington said nothing. Um, this is Muqtada Sadr, is the leader of the movement founded by his uncle, continued by his father, both of whom were killed by the regime. Now the Americans were going after him. Imagine what that looks like if you're an Iraqi person. You are, uh, you may not like him. You may think as many Americans do that uh, a fundamentalism is bad for your country. But you're not just gonna sit idly by and watch while your neighbors are criminalized and gunned down by a, for by a foreign military power. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and people saw Iraqis on one side of this fight and the foreigners on the other, and they picked the Iraqis. Then, uh, more important, the last thing that really was the straw that broke the camel's back was the attack on Fallujah. You know, and as I mentioned, uh, I already talked a lot about that. I mean, just the destruction. I mean, like we're walking around Fallujah in May of 2004 after the bombing had stopped. I mean, it really looked like one of those Hollywood movies where you come in after the apocalypse and whole shopping centers and neighborhoods have been completely destroyed. And you see things like, you know, a stray pillowcase over here, a teddy bear over there, you know, amidst the rubble. I mean, people here didn't see those pictures. But in Iraq, they were broadcast all over the country in Al Jazeera. And plus, there are the people who actually had relatives killed 
and the man I was talking to you about before who was shot right below the collarbone by the U.S. military, he told me, he said, I would have never considered joining the resistance before, but now I will fight until the last breath I have. Killing people is not a good way to make friends. And I think that our administration in Washington doesn't understand that. Uh, they don't understand that when they attack a city like Fallujah, the terrorists that they're trying to kill just leave. Uh, that's what happened in November of 2004 when in the second siege of Fallujah, which was supported by both Bush and Kerry, uh, a lot of innocent civilians were killed. People are living tents outside of Fallujah to this day because their houses have been destroyed. What about these foreign terrorists that we were supposedly trying to kill? Where are they? Has the terrorism stopped? What happened was they went to Mosul, the second largest city in Iraq in the north. They took it over. Mosul is now a no-go area for Americans. Um, meantime, they killed people in Fallujah. Uh, I mean, the terrorists are not going to stick around to be killed when George Bush announces on TV that we're going to attack Fallujah. Um, you know, only the people who live there, where it's their home, are going to be there when the American war planes come. Um, the last thing I would want to say about this is that, uh, I mean, I think that by November when the second attack came, America had already lost Iraq. You know, the influence of these three things, the Abu Ghraib prison scandal, the attack on Muqtada Sadr, and the first siege of Fallujah, they had already pushed people over the edge. And I saw that click. I saw how much Iraq changed at that time uh, in the minds of people, so many people. But uh, in November of 2004, the lesson that the, U that the Bush administration and Kerry learned from the, from the siege of Fallujah and these other things was not... Uh, it wasn't that people were being taken to Abu Ghraib that was the problem. It was the pictures that were the problem, you know. And you heard a lot about these pictures and the problem with the pictures and the need to deal with this problem. Well, you have the same thing with Fallujah. The problem was not that the U.S. military killed so many people in Fallujah that the municipal football stadium had to be turned into a graveyard. The problem was that people saw it on television. And so when America went back and bombed Fallujah again in November, Al Jazeera was banned from Iraq. And the hospital that Al Jazeera had been broadcasting from in April and May had been taken over by the US military as a strategic location to make sure that nobody else broadcasted images from that hospital. And in addition to that, uh, other journalists who have tried to report on Fallujah since then have been arrested. Uh, Al Arabiya, the competing satellite network, they sent a reporter to Fallujah. He was arrested on his way to the airport by the uh, Iraqi police. He was released when he gave over his tapes. A CBS news stringer covering the resistance in Mosul was shot by the U.S. military by accident. They took him to the hospital. They treated his wounds. Then when they looked at his tape and saw that he had been filming the resistance, they arrested him and he remains in prison. Um, so, uh, so this is the situation that we have today. So were they ramping up their uh, war on journalists at that point that you were just talking about? Because it seemed like journalists had been somewhat targeted, or at least foreign journalists that weren't with the pools were being targeted to a degree from early on. I don't think that the U.S. military targets journalists in general. You know, you have the bombing of Al Jazeera during the war. Clearly, the Bush administration does not like Al Jazeera. I mean, Donald Rumsfeld said so all the time. Um, they were bombed during the war. I believe that was on purpose. I mean, it's not like the Bush administration didn't know where they were. But most of the journalists who have been killed in Iraq have either been killed by the resistance or they have been killed in a kind of in the kind of shooting of a journalist that parallels the arrest of the Iraqi politician Mohsen Abdel Hamid. They shoot at journalists because they're shooting at everything. Two Al Arabiya reporters were driving in their van and the U.S. military opened fire at somebody else who ran their checkpoint, but they sprayed fire everywhere in the area and they killed the two Al Arabiya reporters. Um, this is why I think the Americans were shooting at ambulances, you know, in Fallujah. I mean, uh, I got an email from Lieutenant Colonel Eric Knapp of the uh, U.S. Marine First uh, Expeditionary Force criticizing me for saying that the U.S. military was shooting at ambulances. I said, I didn't say that you were shooting at ambulances on purpose. All I'm saying is that I have a photo of an ambulance that you shot at. So you shot at this ambulance, and that is an incontrovertible fact. Um, so... I think that there is not a war on foreign journalists in Iraq. Um, people like myself, uh, I felt, I feared for my life a couple of times 
because I was around jittery American soldiers and I had guns pointed at me by American soldiers. But those guns were put down when they realized who I was. And if I were to have been shot, I would have been shot by accident. I do think, however, that the U.S. military is very concerned about Arabic satellite TV and other forms of Arab media. And uh, you can see um, not only this targeting of journalists that I'm talking about, but also, and just as importantly, uh, a parallel propaganda track by the U.S. military. I mean, under Saddam Hussein, there was Iraqi state TV. It was con controlled by the regime. Americans came in. They toppled the government. They got rid of that TV station. They founded a new TV station called Al Iraqiya, run by the Pentagon. Not only that, they, uh, the Voice of America Arabic service, uh, during the bombing of Afghanistan, they broadcasted an interview by Mullah Mohammed Omar, the leader of the Taliban. That was journalism. It wasn't propaganda. Voice of America Arabic service was shut down. And a new radio was started, Radio Sawa, Radio Together, um, it means. And uh, it's broadcasting English and uh, Arabic pop tunes with uh, little news bulletins friendly to the administration sandwich in between. And people listen to it for the music. Um, they started a satellite channel called Al Hura, which means the freedom. It's broadcast from Virginia in Arabic to the whole Arab world. And uh, when I was flipping around the TV during the assault on Fallujah, when Al Jazeera was broadcasting from the hospital of Fallujah and the, and the graveyard of Fallujah, um, Al Hura was broadcasting a documentary out of Australia about elephants um, because they didn't want to be covering what was going on. Um, so. Uh, so these are the two parallel tracks, propaganda on one side, suppression on the other. Did you see evidence or hear stories of that the incarcerations uh, within Abu Ghraib, that it was actually more widespread than just a single location? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, I one of the stories I write about in the book uh, is about the sheikh in uh, Babylon, who was in the office of the Babylon Human Rights Center, which Paul Wolfowitz had actually visited and called a beacon for human rights. He was giving a speech there, but he was a member of the Sutter movement, of Muqtada Sutter, and this was a time when we were targeting everyone in the Sutter movement as the American military. So he was arrested and he was taken to Abu Ghraib, although it took a really long time to figure out where he was because the American soldiers and the Iraqi policemen who took him away came from another part of town and it actually took weeks for his family uh, even with the assistance of Western journalists to locate that he was being held in Abu Ghraib. Uh, this was in uh, late April 2004. He is still in prison, this sheikh. He, had been, he has been charged with murder, although the U.S. military hasn't said who he murdered. I mean, you can't have that here in this country where you're accused of murder, but they can't say who you killed. Um, uh, he had been in prison under Saddam Hussein uh, for giving a sermon against the regime. Uh, he had had to flee to Syria at multiple times to avoid Saddam Hussein. And now he's in American custody. Now, first he was in Abu Ghraib. And, uh, that apparently was too close to his family, which kept demanding to visit him. So now he's being held in Basra. There's a gigantic prison in Um, in, uh, um Qasr, uh, which is a port city at the very south of Iraq. Um, and everywhere you go in Iraq, there are smaller prisons. Uh, there are military bases all around Iraq run by the U.S. military. I mean, we hear about these 14 enduring military bases that the U.S. military is planning to build. These will be large bases. But all around town, just like the police, <laughs> there are little military bases. And people are constantly being rounded up and taken to these bases. Uh, they're held for a while. They're interrogated. They receive, I think, some light forms of torture. For example, everyone that I've interviewed has been hooded. Everyone has been beaten, you know. And, and, and uh, I believe it's the case that the more graphic kinds of uh, torture that we've heard about on the news, uh, that those do happen, uh, uh, but not to everyone. But there is a certain type of torture that it seems systematically everyone gets. And um, so they get that. And then after a while, the kind of U.S. military kind of figures out who might be involved in the resistance and who is not based on all of the people that they have arrested in a sweep. And then they release the people who they have arrested in the sweep from this local military base, and they send the ones they want to keep to Abu Ghraib. That's what happened to Mohsen Abdel Hamid. He was picked up in a sweep, uh, this Iraqi politician. Um, all the hundreds of people who are picked up and then released it's not a good way to make friends. 
One of the prerequisites from the U.S., uh, current U.S. administration's viewpoint, I think, to be able to pull out is that there has to be some type of military force in there to take over. And I think the one that they're obviously leaning towards is Iraqis, you know, the Iraqi army and or police forces taking over. Yet you have pointed out that there's been massive um, people leaving those forces and or uh, going over to the resistance. Do you foresee that trend continuing? I don't think it's possible uh, for the Bush administration to succeed in building a new Iraqi army before leaving Iraq. Because as long as the occupation continues, the new Iraqi army will be part of the occupation. And one, people not, will not want to join it. And two, the people who do join will be targets of attacks as collaborators. Uh, when the U.S. military attacked Fallujah in uh, April and May of 2004, the U.S. military admits that fully half of the Iraqi army deserted and 10 percent mutinied. It means they fought against the Americans uh, on the side of the resistance. Now, um, in northern uh, Iraq, there are the Kurdish people. The Kurdish people have a better relationship with the Americans. The Americans don't patrol their streets. They don't take people to Abu Ghraib. They let them run their own affairs. They have their own ministries. Uh, they are, have their streets patrolled not by foreign American military soldiers, but by their own people. Kurdish militiamen control the streets of Erbil, Suleimania, Kirkuk, not the American military. So people have a better impression of the Americans. So uh, a lot of the people in the Iraqi army who fought against Fallujah alongside the Americans were Kurds. So people say, well, if we leave, there will be civil war. I mean, we are the people who are taking the Kurdish Peshmerga from northern Iraq and asking them to kill uh, Arabs for us in Fallujah. That's uh, the U.S. military doing that. That's not uh, not some kind of conspiracy. It's, it's fact. It's happening. And, um, and in addition to that, uh, I mean, there are lots of people in Iraq who want Iraq to be strong. They want it to be a strong country. Um, but they don't want to help the American occupation. I mean, joining the Iraqi army means taking part in these house-to-house -house searches and taking people to Abu Ghraib who may be your neighbors. I mean, who wants to do that? Who wants to put their life on the line to arrest their own neighbors? Talk about what you perceive as a responsibility as a journalist because it seems like you were kind of going against the grain of what Pacifica wanted to report from early on. And then if you see a parallel to that with us as U.S. citizens to really try and look at what's really going on and to separate ourselves from the different propagandas, no matter what direction they're coming from. Well, I just think as a journalist, um, I mean, it sounds kind of hokey, you know, but... I think people have an obligation to report what they see, and then people have an obligation to listen to the journalist who's reporting what he's seeing. You know, uh, I was uh, I was listening to commercial radio yesterday, and uh, there was a guest on. The guest was making sense, but I was more concerned with the callers actually, because the callers who were calling in they were just set in the way that they thought, and they weren't actually listening to the guest. Some of them were calling in to call the guest an idiot, and some of them were calling in to say they supported the guest, but none of them called in and said, you know what, I hear what you're saying, let me bring my own thoughts to the table and then listen to what you have to say as an experienced person on this issue. And, um, and uh, I think that our culture, yeah, I think it could respect a little bit more uh, uh, I mean, that's why we have, uh, I mean, that's why Fox News is the number one news network. I don't think it's because America's a right-wing place, necessarily. I think it's because people are really driven towards people who tell them what to think, unfortunately. And uh, that's why, you know, Rush Limbaugh is successful. It's also why certain people on the left are more successful than other people on the left, people who have mastered the art of Rush Limbaughing with a different set of politics. And... Um, and I think that's dangerous, you know, uh, you know, but all I can do as a journalist is keep plugging away, you know, and, and, and try to do the best that I can and, and just, uh, you know, try to keep a check on myself as much as I can. All right. So what do you see as the current situation in Iraq 
Where do you see, uh, ideally, what the U.S. role should be at this point? Well, I was in Iraq during the elections period. I left in mid-February. You know, and it's true. A lot of people in Iraq went to the polls to vote, and they got their first democratic government in 80 years of the Iraqi state. And uh, this was not something that the Bush administration wanted. You know, when the invasion happened, people wanted elections. There were massive demonstrations for elections in the streets in Baghdad. But uh, instead of organizing an election, the Bush administration hired this company called the Research Triangle International out of North Carolina. The Research Triangle is these three towns in North Carolina that all have universities and lots of, like, uh, genetics and uh, computer companies, you know. So this is the Research Triangle of Research Triangle International. And they went to Iraq, and their slogan, this is their slogan, I'm not making this up, uh, this is what they said they were doing. Their slogan was selections, not elections. That was their slogan. And they went into different communities and they said, okay, we need so many Kurds, so many Shia Arabs, so many Sunni Arabs, so many Turkmen. They sowed the seeds for the current ethnic tensions that we're seeing now by forcing people to uh, organize on the basis of their ethnic status. I mean, imagine uh, foreign military power comes to Seattle. They demand that people organize themselves. Okay, we need so many uh, Caucasian Christians. We need so many... Uh, Asian Americans, and within that we need so many people from Vietnam, so many people from China, so many people from the Philippines, and we need so many black people, you know, and then, like, people have to just organize themselves solely on the basis of their ethnic background. Then are we surprised when different ethnic groups are fighting with each other? Um, but despite that, there was finally public pressure to hold an election. An election was held January 30th. And the victorious slate in this election, the Shiite political uh, parties, that, uh, as I've mentioned, America was supporting Saddam so that he would oppress these parties uh, because they're friendly with Iran, they won the election. They had a platform to end the occupation within nine months to a year. Almost after they got elected, Donald Rumsfeld went on TV and said, we have no exit strategy for Iraq. We have a victory strategy. And George Bush said, we have no timetable for withdrawal. What happened to the idea of democracy? You know, um, so I think, first of all, we have to respect the will of the Iraqi people uh, through their elections and through the way people, and, and also pay attention to the resistance as a political force and not just a military force. Um, because the resistance are people that reject the new government as well. Um, if I were George Bush, what I would do is I would go on television and I would say, uh, I have a special message today for the people of Iraq. We're very proud uh, that we have been able to uh, liberate you from the tyrant Saddam Hussein and we look forward to his trial uh, and justice. Um, we want you to know uh, that we came to Iraq to support democracy, and we did not come to occupy and control your country. And so we will bring all 135,000 U.S. soldiers home within a year, and you will begin to see American soldiers leaving almost immediately. You know, you, you will be able to see it in your daily life that the checkpoints that keep you from going to work in the morning, which are the center of so much violence and the house-to-house -house searches, that these things will stop and you will begin to see troops leaving. And, and I, will, I, will, I will bet a considerable amount of money that if George Bush were to make that kind of speech, that the resistance would die down almost instantly. Uh, because that's what happened after the elections. You know, there was a lot of violence right before the election, and a lot of people even were so scared that they fled to other countries like Jordan, Syria, uh, or Iran before the election because they were so concerned because there was so much violence. But then once the election happened and America did actually not try to fix the election and allowed these Shiite religious parties and Kurdish uh, officials to win, uh, violence died down for a while. People stopped fighting. Uh, the streets got safer. Then, when it became clear that the U.S. military was not actually interested in democracy in Iraq and was going to perpetuate the status quo to continue, now we have the current situation where violence has increased again. Um, so I believe if Bush were to make a speech like that, violence would almost immediately drop. And then, uh, if we were to actually leave, then I think that the violence would remain minimal. Uh, of course, everything wouldn't be all right. The country is devastated. 
there's no electricity, there's uh, dirty water, um, there is a conflict between different groups that's arisen on our watch, and will have to be sorted out, it may be violent, but the healing can begin at that point. The Iraqi society can begin to start sorting things out. As long as the occupation is there on top of everything, it is almost impossible to solve any of these problems because nobody can do anything in their daily lives. Um, time and time again, in talking to people with the resistance, I would say to them, what are you going to do about these foreign fighters who are blowing themselves up in front of schools, in front of mosques, killing innocent people? What are you go like? What what about these people? The same question so many Americans ask me as I go walking around. Uh, and they will say, once the occupation ends, then we can deal with these people. But for now, we can't attack people who are attacking the Americans. We have to end the occupation. So I think that uh, if the U.S. occupation ends, that Iraq will be able to build its own military to defend itself. Uh, and that it may not be pretty, but it will be better than the current situation. All right. Well, I want to thank you for spending time with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. We've just been talking with Aaron Glantz. He is a reporter with Pacifica Radio and author of the book, How America Lost Iraq.